Hi folks, this is Mark by Mark A. Foster PhD for the Institute for Dialectical Metarealism. Today I want to attempt to produce a discussion of Zionism and other forms of imperialism that won't drive me out of my mind, uh, which is what I found what was happening uh, exactly this past season when I spent so much time talking about the subject, and it was literally driving me crazy. Um, as an autistic, I have a tough time dealing with mm, extreme emotion, put it that way. Um, when I am confronted by extreme emotion, I tend to go back into a shell and I don't know why, but that's the way I've always been since I was a child. When other kids would abuse me, which was constant, basically beating me up, walking home from school, I would simply go home and I would stay there. And then my mother would come to me and say, Mark, Go out and play with your friends. And I would think to myself, what friends? I don't have any friends. I only have enemies. I have people who hate me, who beat me up, who bully me constantly. And so I had to deal with both the constant bullying and the constant pressure from my mother to, um, I don't know, to engage with other children. And obviously I didn't like either one. Now I might have under other circumstances liked engaging with other children, would have been nice, but uh, given my circumstances, my autism, um, that made that kind of impossible. And so as a result, I simply ignored my mother. It was the only way that I could cope. I ignored her. She got angry. I ignored her more. She got angrier. I ignored her even more. She got even angrier and angrier. And uh, so that was really a totally failed activity. I was never able as a kid to engage with other children because to, to do that meant being beaten up. And obviously, I didn't want to get beaten up. Um, is that unusual? Not for autistics, it isn't. Autistics get beaten up all the time. It is a common thing among the autistic community, primarily autistic children, but not exclusively, also autistic adults. I mean, I have been bullied as an adult as well, but not anywhere near as much as I was bullied as a child. And so... I have learned over the years how to deal with my emotions and that basically I am happiest when I am sitting alone in my condo. I am. I am really happy alone. Nobody is around to tell me what to do. Nobody's around to bully me. And I can do whatever I want. And now as a retired professor, I have no students to worry about. I have no dean to worry about. It's just me. It's just me. And uh, so um, that is actually comforting to me. So uh, please don't feel bad for me. I I'm sharing this. Uh, to um, put light 
or shine light, I guess, is more appropriate on an aspect of my life, which I think is important to know. Because my experience is not unique. It is the experience of a lot of autistic kids. So as a result, I am careful what I talk about. And I'm careful how I talk about it. Because not to do so can send me into a panic attack. And it frequently does. Panic attacks are common among autistics. And not only among autistics, they're common among a lot of people with different types of psychological problems. But certainly, they are common among autistics. From firsthand experience, I can testify to that. And yet, by the same token, as I feel a need to protect my emotions, and one way to do so is to refrain from talking that much about politics and partisanship, I also feel a need to address the issues of the day. And those issues mostly, at least from my perspective, center around imperialism. But I don't want to get back into this thing of condemning people. Because if I do that, I'll go back onto my roller coaster. And I don't want to be on a roller coaster. I don't want to be upset constantly. I don't want to uh, be on a constant um, feeling, have, have a constant feeling that something horrible is about to happen to me, which is exactly the feeling I get when I talk about controversial things, especially politics. I love politics. There's nothing that I love more than politics. Well, maybe that's a slight exaggeration. But I certainly love politics. Um, as a professor, it was a part of my bread and butter. I talked about politics all the time in my classes. And I invited my students to do the same. Did they? Not really, hardly ever. I mean, anybody who has been a professor can tell you the same thing. Getting students to talk is really, really, really hard. Students generally like to keep their mouths shut. Why? I don't know. Maybe they're afraid they might say the wrong thing. Maybe they're afraid they might embarrass themselves. Maybe they're afraid that uh, that I might criticize them, which I never would. I don't know. But I've noticed that through my years as a college professor, which of course involved teaching, research, and committee work, primarily those three things. And the research and committee work were fine. I had no problem at all with that. It was only with the teaching that I had a problem. And it's not because I don't enjoy teaching. I love it. But it's because I, I've got to be careful what it is that I say so I don't get myself all riled up. And my tendency is to do just that, to get myself all riled up. That's my nature. I'm a very... Um, I was going to say an emotional person, but that probably isn't the best word. I'm a person who is very easily upset. That's act more accurate. And getting upset often involves talking about things that I don't want to talk about at the time. Although I love talking about politics, 
I also hate talking about politics. Now talk about that for an enigma. How could I love something and hate it at the same time? But I do. So what I have determined to do is to try to address some of the issues that I have been addressing. But to do so in somewhat of a less political, partisan, controversial tone. Now, I am not sure if that is possible. I'm really not. But I will try. If it doesn't work, I will tell you it's not working. I will be honest with you. And I will back down from it and do something else. There are plenty of things I can talk about. I have a big mouth. I do have a big mouth. There are a lot of things that I can discuss. I don't need to discuss partisan politics, to discuss third worldism, to discuss socialism from below or any of the subjects I have been addressing, intersectional Marxism, and so on. I don't need to, but I'd like to. So, with that long qualification, um, I will begin to attempt to address subjects that ordinarily I try to stay clear of namely political issues. And I don't know if it is possible to talk about politics non-politically. I don't think that's possible, but maybe it is. I will give it a shot. By non-politically, what I mean is um, without getting all wrapped up in it, um, without becoming overly um angry which is what i have been getting um i'm going through a lot of difficulties in my life right now primarily for my sister as i've talked already and that's making it really difficult for me to barely function because i love her but she has indicated to me that she wants nothing to do with me for reasons that I literally don't understand, except the fact that she has borderline personality disorder, which can cause people to behave that way. So I guess in a, in a way I do understand it, but having never experienced that disorder, it is hard for me to relate to it. It's not something that I have uh, any direct knowledge of. I've observed it in her, maybe in others, I'm not sure. I can't think of any cases where I have. That's not to say I haven't, but I know I have observed it in her throughout her life. And I have known her her entire life because she is three years, nine months younger than me. So literally, when she was born, I was already alive. Okay, so let me give this a shot and see how it works. Give it a shot. Essentially, when I've been talking about Zionism, I've been talking about imperialism. The major and most significant contradiction in capitalism. Imperialism is a very destructive force. Or I guess I would say, as a critical realist, a very destructive causal mechanism 
meaning it can lead to all sorts of unanticipated consequences. Um, countries that engage in imperialism do so generally for their own perceived benefit, whether it's economic, whether it's social, whether it's educational, whether it's status, I don't know. I assume that people who engage in imperialism have some reason for doing it. Now, can I relate to it? No. Because I'm not an imperialist. And even if I wanted to be one, how could I be? I'm just Mark, right? I'm just Mark. I live alone. Who would I be an imperialist over? Nobody. So there's nobody literally that I could practice imperialism on. I can't experience it firsthand in terms of my own personal life. I can't. But what we see in the world today, whether it is with the actions of NATO, whether it is with the actions of Israel, whether it is with the actions of Russia, whether it is the possible actions of mainland China on Taiwan, or alternately known as the Republic of China, um, imperialism is ever-present. It is all around us. We really cannot escape it. But there are things that we can do. And so rather than condemn particular imperialisms and become overly political, which in my view accomplishes next to nothing, I was going to say nothing, but next, next to nothing is probably more accurate. There are things that I know I can do and maybe that you can do to stand up to imperialism, to fight it, to deal with it intelligently. Here's what I mean. And I am now returning to a theme I have addressed over and over and over again in this podcast, conscientization. I love conscientization. Conscientization developed as a part of the late Paulo Freire's critical pedagogy. As a professor, a retired professor now, I tried to practice critical pedagogy with my students, which is basically um, trying to awaken students to their conscience and their consciousness of class. So I did that all the time with my students. I don't know how successful I was. I think that isn't a question open for debate, but I tried. I always tried to engage in conscientization. I would say, at least in my opinion, that conscientization is the major factor involved in critical pedagogy. Of course, pedagogy is the art of teaching. That's pedagogy. Critical, well, if you want to go back to the ultimate origins, it's Immanuel Kant with his various books that had the word critique in them, most famously critique of pure reason. 
but I am using it in a more specific sense, in the sense of critical realism. And so to me, engaging in a critique of imperialism, whether it's a critique of the empire, whether it's a critique, a critique of Zionism, or, or any other kind of imperialism, ultimately comes down to the same basic thing. We are talking about how it is that we can apply the critical realism of Roy Baskar to our, our understanding of the world. At least that's my perspective. And the way I apply it in this context is by seeing imperialism as what Roy referred to as demi-reality. Demi-reality to Roy is an actual, real condition of being. It is not a social construct. It is real. Roy was a realist, an ontological realist, not an ontological idealist. So what he talked about were things that he regarded to be real. Now, I will admit that I think that Roy, toward the end of his life, unfortunately deviated from that critical realism a bit, for which he was widely criticized, but I actually came up with a solution to it, which I've written about, but that's not really appropriate to discuss here. But there's a very easy solution to the fact that Roy appears, at least to me and to many other critical realists, to have journeyed from realism to idealism, which to me, and to most other critical realists I know, is not good. Idealism is not a useful perspective on life. If you go back to um, the discussion that Engels had of utopian socialism, utopian you know, socialism, utopian and scientific, he basically, in that book, condemns idealism. Utopian socialism is an expression of idealism. Scientific socialism, which might also perhaps uh, be seen in a kind of um, concrete utopianism. But in any event, critical realism, ontological realism, is about the reality of the world that we live in. Not about some ideal construct of it that we make up in our minds. Simply said. So, where does that leave us? To me, it leaves us with the proposition of what direction do we want to pursue? For me, that direction is realism, critical realism. And imperialism, when looked at from the perspective of critical realism, is demi-reality. Now, what did Roy mean by demi-reality? For Roy, Demi-reality was a translation of the Sanskrit term maya, illusion. Um, by demi-reality, Roy also meant disunity. He also used the term splitting. When I first saw that word splitting, my thought was, what, a, what an amateurish word to use. <laughs> That's what I first thought. But the more I reflected on it, the more I realized why he was referring to demi-reality as splitting. 
because what we are seeing in the world around us is a literal splitting or factionalization, if you wish, of society. And that is certainly true in cases of imperialism. Whether you were talking about the imperialism carried out by the U.S., by Israel, or by any other country. And for Roy, the solution to imperialism, the solution to, to demi-reality, ultimately, is co-presence. Co-presence means, to Roy, that I live with others in a state of unity. I am present with others, co-present with others. So I'm not by myself. None of us is alone. We are all accompanied by others. Co-presence is a part of what Roy referred to as non-duality. Non-duality for Roy was a translation of the Sanskrit word Advaita. Literally, Advaita translates as non-dual. But it's usually translated as non-duality. The idea of Advaita, or non-duality, is that the world that we live in, while made up of different parts, like different people, different animals, different machines, etc., on its deepest level, is one. So Advaita is oneness. And co-presence is the way in which we express that oneness in our relationships with others. So Roy defined the dialectic as consisting of three different stages. The first stage is absence. The second stage is absenting the absence. The third stage is transformation. So demi-reality is an absence. It is an absence of unity, an absence of co-presence, an absence of non-duality, an absence of non-splitting, if that's a word. And so by living in a condition of co-presence, we are reaching for the stage of non-duality or Advaita. That's what Roy basically said. And I'm sorry if this is overly technical, but it, it is overly technical, so I can't help it. Um, the basic idea that Roy was getting at was that we all need to move away from demi-reality. Imagine this. This is the metaphor I used with my students. You are in a room. In that room are trapped doors. People with guns hiding behind doors. Improvised explosive devices. Hand grenades. All sorts of really undesirable things are in that room. In addition, the lights are turned out, so you don't know where to go. It's like you're walking around blindfolded in a place where you literally might die at any moment. What Roy said is that by absenting the absence of demi-reality, we arrive at a condition of co-presence, which is a part of non-duality, meaning that we begin to see each other 
not as enemies, but as allies, as people that we can work with to establish communism. Now, if I haven't said this before, I think I have, but maybe not. Roy was a communist. He admired both Russia and Cuba. I should say the Soviet Union and Cuba. Um, so I imagine he was a Marxist-Leninist. Um, but he very rarely talked about it. He he was he was a philosopher. He was not a politician or a political scientist. He was interested in developing a philosophy of how the world works. And demi-reality and co-presence are two ingredients in how the world works. So we didn't really spend much time discussing politics or political science. He focused his attention on developing a philosophy or as I prefer to call it, a methodology, a methodology for achieving communism. And as I would put it, and I am literally putting words into Roy's mouth, I apologize for that, a method for achieving Maoism third worldism, meaning um, since the first world is not in a position right now, to um, have revolutions. We don't really have much revolutionary potential in the West. We don't have much dialectical potential in the first world. We may have some. If there is some, I would like that person to show it to me because I don't see it. But maybe, maybe there is some. But the question is, is it enough? Is it enough? And my response to that is no. No, it's definitely not enough. We, we are not really living in a time where um, getting to a point of communism or communisms in the sense of perhaps different communisms in diff different nations is going to be that easy. We need to go through a lot of suffering and turmoil first. And I think that suffering and turmoil will take place mostly in the first world. That first world includes the United States, and by extension, NATO, because really NATO is simply an expansion of the U.S. I mean, it's nothing distinct from the U.S. It's really a part of the U.S. It's how the U.S. operates. Uh, and Israel. Those two nations are part of the first world, as are many others. And I think that before we can get to the point where the third world is able to establish communism and perhaps perhaps eventually the first world too maybe i don't know i'm not a prophet or i'm a really really lousy one as i've said many times um Before we can get to that stage, we need to go through a lot of turmoil. And I think that we are seeing that turmoil right now. I discussed my sister the other day and the problems that she was having. And the fact that she has done something that she's never done before because she's always talked about how much she loved me. I guess she 
doesn't love me anymore or something. She's cut me off. Do I take that personally? No, I don't take it personally. I see it as her. It's her life and the troubles in her life. It's, I don't really, I don't project her, that her own problems on myself. I don't. But I feel bad for her. Because I'm in a situation where there is literally nothing that I can do. That is also demi-reality. It's not imperialism. But it's demi-reality nonetheless. So all forms of demi-reality. Whether imperialism. Whether the kind of splitting. That seems to exist right now in human relationships needs to be absented, absenting the absence and replaced with co presence. It is only co presence that can do that absenting, nothing else. Anything else we try, in my opinion, will ultimately fail. Anything, anything that we try will ultimately fail. Um, I don't care how reasoned it is, how well thought out it is, how well planned it is. Unless we can eliminate the demi-reality in our world. And, and that includes the demi-reality in me. I'm certainly not excluding myself. But also, and perhaps even more importantly, the demi-reality in the world around us, we will remain in this toxic state that we are in right now. And we will never, ever find a way out of it. So I really hope that we do. Now, I said at the beginning of this podcast, that I would, I would attempt to discuss the issues I have been discussing in ways that would not drive me mad. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I've, if I've been effective at that. I would appreciate your feedback in the comment section right below this video. If you think I've been effective, I will, I will consider that. But of course, I will also consider my own sense, my own feeling about the subject. And personally, right now, I am still not entirely convinced that I've been successful. To be honest, I am not. And that makes me very sad. But maybe it shouldn't. Maybe it means that I just need to work on it harder and come up with new strategies for talking about these subjects without immersing myself into a condition of demi-reality. My brain in a condition of demi-reality, which is what happened in the last season of this podcast. And now is a really tough time for me because of my sister. Primarily, not, not exclusively, but primarily. And so I need to watch carefully where I step. I am not con con I'm not convinced that I did that this time. I'm not convinced. And so I really would appreciate your feedback, your thoughts, your honest thoughts. I mean, 
don't hold anything back. I'm not talking about flaming me. Please don't flame me. It's not nice. But your your honest thoughts about whether you think that I've been successful. Because I want to talk about these things, but I don't want to drive myself into a it's a complete lunacy either. It's not worth it to me. It, it just isn't. Because it, it, even if, if I drive myself into lunacy, I won't be effective in my conscientization. So, so it won't help anybody. Not only won't it help me, it won't help anyone else. So there's no point to it. For now, this is Mark by Mark A. Foster, Ph.D., for the Maoist, or the Institute for Dialectical Metarealism, rather. Have a pleasant day and an even better day tomorrow.